Good afternoon and welcome to the Gold Coast Open House 2023 Architecture Festival. My name is Jemima Rosevear and I'm incredibly excited to present the second of our two um, uh, Open House Talks panel discussions, Small Living, Big Opportunities or Hidden Problems. Before we commence and in the spirit of reconciliation, Gold Coast Open House acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Please switch your mobile phones to silent. In the event of emergency, please head towards the green running man sign and take the, the direction of the hotter staff. And we also note that, note that tonight's session is being recorded as well. But firstly, a bit about Gold Coast Open House. The aim of the Gold Coast Open House is to engage the general public in dialogue with architects through the promotion of contemporary and historical architecture and design in our city. Our goal is to communicate the process of placemaking and highlight the range of professionals involved in the creation of amazing spaces, places, and buildings within our incredible city of the Gold Coast. We are a non-for-profit organisation and rely solely on volunteers and sponsors such as those here on the screen. Please support Gold Coast Open House by volunteering and sharing your experiences on social media and with friends. So now I'd like to start tonight's session and introduce our wonderful and varied panel of experts. First here is our moderator for tonight, Nicole Bennett, who is the State Manager of Queensland and Northern Territory for the Planning Institute of Australia, the peak professional body for planners and champion good planning. She's an interrogator and creative problem solver and believes good planning is the solution to our wicked societal problems. On our panel, we also have Dr Heather Shearer. She's an interdisciplinary researcher and has worked across housing affordability, climate change adaptation, and active and public transport analysis. Her experience includes spatial analysis and mapping, communications management, development assessment, and policy. Heather has also worked for the Queensland and New South Wales state governments, and also lectures in urban and environmental planning. She su supervises honours and PhD candidates and has published in academic journals. Then in the middle, we have Jimmy Hurst. Jimmy launched the Polkadot brand to advocate for affordable, eco-smart tiny houses on wheels for the mainstream. These offer locally made housing, off the grid, renewable and recycled, climatically efficient, intelligent, internet and blockchain enabled, attractive, economical, easy transportable dwellings that are designed to easily plug into holistically integrative and regenerative communities. Jimmy, so well. <laughs> Jimmy aims to advocate, facilitate and build future housing models, including mobile eco parks. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Lara is next and Lara Noble co-founded the Tiny House Company to deliver transportable and semi-permanent housing solutions throughout Australia and during this period lived in the first tiny house they built, an 1818 square metre house built on a trailer. Lara completed her carpentry apprenticeship in 2016 and now spends much of her time designing and building small-scale residential and alternative housing pro projects in Brisbane. And then last but not least on the end there is Amy Degenhart. Amy is the director of three companies, uh, Degenhart Shed Architecture and Urban Design, as well as Urban Pure and Bubble Up. The latter two serve as delivery mechanisms for her innovative and affordable housing solutions such as MV Micro Urban Village, containing the tiniest freehold residential lot in Australia. Amy is currently collaborate, uh, creating a collection of tiny co-housing pocket homes as part of the Better Neighbourhoods Logan Initiative. So please join me and put your hands together to welcome our panel tonight. Thank you everyone for coming out and um, we hope that you enjoy this conversation. We're going to structure it by having a bit of a chat. I've got a few questions for each of the panellists to grease the wheels and then we'll, uh, Jemima will bring a microphone around so 
please get your questions ready um, and we'll leave plenty of time for those. Um, so small living, big opportunities or hidden problems is the theme of tonight. Um, and we've had a, a pre-panel discussion uh, and sort of to set the mood for this, you know, we decided that we really do need housing that responds to the needs of the community. Um, from the demographics, of which we'll discuss, Heather's got some information there, we know there's a real need for smaller housing. You know, we've got single person households increasing really quickly. Um, and we know we need more well located housing to reduce transport time and costs uh, so that people can live closer to services, workplaces, education, and just create a more sustainable settlement pattern and preserve our natural environment. So the question here tonight is, is tiny homes part of that solution to our housing troubles? And if so, how do we make this an option that's attainable for more people? So I'd like to start with you, Heather, and ask you, what is a tiny house? That's actually a surprisingly complicated question. And whenever I go on the media about tiny houses, they ask two questions. One, what is a tiny house? And two, how many people live in tiny houses? And both of those are actually quite complicated to answer. But generally speaking, a tiny house could be defined purely by size, which would be any small dwelling, or by, for example, what the Australian Tiny House Association defines as a small house on wheels or on skids. Basically, skids are just, you know, it's back, it's on a tilt truck and it's moved into a place. So it's not necessarily road transportable. But... Um, I, a couple of years ago, I wrote a paper with um, my boss, Paul, Professor Paul Burton, and, and it was on specifically what is a tiny house. And um, we came to the conclusion that sometimes a tiny house is what people who live in tiny houses think a tiny house is. So whereas an apartment may be a tiny house, a caravan may be a tiny house. Um, so it's quite broad, but I'd say in generally speaking, probably when you're thinking about a tiny house, it's a small dwelling under a certain amount of square metres and it may or may not be on wheels. Give me the square metre that you're thinking. Well, a tiny house on wheels is generally about 24 to 28 square metres. That includes the loft area because it's constrained by size, but that's a sort of average. So that would be an eight metre tiny house with a loft area, for example, because it can't be more than 4.2 metres high because of road rules and it can't be more than 2.4 metres wide. In terms of a tiny house uh, that's on foundations or fixed, we're talking probably about 35 square metres. And... Based on your research, are they currently a popular choice in Australia? Tiny houses are a popular, but not necessarily choice. And the main reason for that is they're extremely popular on Instagram and other social media. But um, one of the reasons they are not necessarily always a choice is because the where you can put a tiny house, particularly in the suburban areas and parts of the around in anywhere that's urban is very, very complicated. It differs between local governments. It differs between zones of local governments. And it's quite complicated. And sometimes it is also organised, sometimes depending by which person in which section of a council you talk to. So some councils, for example, it might be regulated under local laws, some under planning, and some under building and plumbing. So it's quite complicated. And sometimes it depends on who you talk to. Um, my current research actually is, is um, researching local governments around Australia about tiny and other alternate houses. Awesome. I'm going to let you off the hook for a minute now and move to Lara and Jimmy. So you both have experiences both living in and building tiny homes. Um, Jimmy, can I start with you? Can you pitch to us in one to two minutes why tiny homes are a great option? And now. I couldn't fit it all in there. Well, I've been living in a tiny house for five years and I have actually lived in a normal house in the meantime of that. And, I, oh, hey, if I live in a tiny house for the rest of my life, I'm set, I'm fine, I'm happy with it. How much space we don't need to have in a house. And remember, the first tiny houses in Australia were, the first houses in Australia were actually tiny houses built by the first early settlers. And actually, the indigenous were living in tiny houses way back when. Um... You save a lot of money. 
affordability, efficiency, the whole minimalism thing. You can't buy jet skis one after the other. You can't buy stuff, which is a consumeristic thing, which is delightful to get out of Great Depression, but we don't need it anymore. So my incentive is to re-gift all the gifts that I get given because I really don't have any space to put it, and I really don't want them anyway because I've kind of gone a little bit more experiential in life. Um, saving money, forming community. To me, this is the biggest thing, but it's the most challenging thing, which is what we like to focus on with Polkadot, is how do we maybe shift the paradigm? Terrible words to use, but how could we shift it so people would be more contented, more connected to each other? So the tiny housing allows me to move very spontaneously. In fact, I offered Jemima to bring my tiny house down, which is an eight by 10 foot tiny house, which has got more things in it than your average house. Air conditioning a whole lot. It makes water out of the air, even turns into a disco. So, because you need that sometimes when you've got to do staying alive. So, you can live in a small space and you've got so much freedom. You're not shackled to taxes, council rates, and all these things, and expenses, and mortgages, and interest rates, and blah, 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 blah. So, it's really quite liberating as well. So I could have moved my tiny house down here and slept in the car park overnight and then bing, bang, here I am, and then talk about it. And then I can just drive up to Heather's place and park it in her driveway. Now I can take that house to Woodford, the folk festival. Then I can go to the blues festival. So the freedom of being able to take your house, not a caravan, but a house, to anywhere you want. I can put it to Alice Springs. I've got water coming out of the air. I don't need to worry about a drought because I've got it coming out of the air at night time. It's just so liberating. And I'm still experiencing all the potentials of this. So that's my three minutes. <laughs> I love it. Um, you touched on economic benefit. You touched on community benefit. Can you just talk to me quickly about the sustainability benefits of a tiny home? Well, when you're thinking of a tiny house, you're always still using new materials, except we, in our tiny house prototype, we recycled all the windows and doors and recycled timber for the benches and stuff like that. But you can't do it for the whole thing. So... We focused on low gassing materials as well, so as much natural as we could, so when it gets hot, it actually smells like wood, not like a caravan and chemicals, which are really bad for your health. Um, the sustainability is before, because you're living in a small space, you're, you can't collect lots of stuff, like I said before, so minimalism plays a great role. So we're helping reduce people's uh, environmental footprint. Needlessly, you don't need to buy lots of stuff, so it, it naturally tends people that way. And because they're climatically, they can be built very efficiently, I showed that my tiny house to a lady who's going to help us build them. And uh, she was so stunned on a normal warm day recently, our tiny house with its solar panels. She walked in and said, it's so cool in here. And I said, well, yeah, it's got insulation. Caravans don't do that and vans don't do that either. So it really is a caravan built like a house. Um, you just waste less energy cleaning it, of course, um, Vacuuming is just a little black and decker thing. You don't need a big vacuum cleaner. You save so much money. So um, we're taking water out of the air. We're not leaning on the infrastructure for electricity or water. So we're reducing environmental impacts of all that infrastructure, which is really quite needless because everything we have is in the sun and the air around us. And I'm living that. So I'm not just talking at my... I'm actually talking. This is really happening. We can really do this. Um, so... There probably are some more, but because I'm under pressure here to answer within two minutes, <laughs> don't shoot me on my white paper. No, you've done well. Um, Thank you. You're off the hook now. I'm going to move to Lara. Uh, <laughs> Lara, you're an architect and a carpenter, so you can take an idea and create a design and then actually deliver it, and you're working in the tiny house space. I'm keen to hear from you what some of the challenges or barriers are to actually delivering and seeing more tiny houses be built. Um, yeah, um, there's lo this is working. Yeah, um, I'm no longer working in the tiny houses on wheels, but I'm still in the space of small spaces. So our projects <laughs> are pretty small. Um, one of the big challenges, I think, and it's a really like lame answer. It's not that fun, but it's the cost of construction. And I think that's why quite a lot of our projects are small. Like we're talking with peop like people who want quality over quantity. And so they come to us, they want a good quality design. They want us to make <laughs> their budget work well for them. The cost of 
materials and everything, but then the ongoing costs of the house as well. So they want to invest in this little space that they're going to come home to every day, they're going to wake up to every day. And they, I think that's one of the biggest challenges for us is because people's budgets are really tight and the cost of everything is so much. And because also we've been moving out of the ones on wheels, like we did do that years ago, but we've moved into more uh, traditional, very small granny flats kind of homes. So we have to go through all, the, which is, a, you know, pros and cons, but like all through the professional channels of like getting approvals, engineering, certification, all of the stuff that has to happen for a normal house. But convincing people that actually it makes sense for them to, to shrink it down and to leave space or to the opportunities that arise from having the house smaller. So a lot of the stuff that we do, they're sharing a property. So like kind of like mini co-housing, but in a city where there's a few, that's, in fact, that's how we're living at the moment as well um, and intend to for uh, long term. So I think the biggest challenge <laughs> is that and also sustainability to try and make people understand that it, it, it covers a lot of things. Like sustainability can be one thing for one person, another thing for another, but you need to sort of like wrap it all up together. And one of the best, like e kind of like easiest ways to explain it is like build small, make it quality, don't use a lot of materials, put insulation in, you know, composting toilet where possible, collect some energy from the solar, have a water tank, like just some of these, like they seem like boring and easy, obvious things. Um, but if you can do that, then you, people can take ownership of that side of it as well. So. I don't know, some challenges. Awesome. Um, can you let us know around, I'm, I'm interested to explore the costs a bit more because mm -hmm. I think there might be some interest in the audience around, you know, are we talk, you know, are we talking sort of a traditional, you know, cost per square metre to build a tiny home like, like a normal house? Even higher sometimes. Yeah. And, and so where do the cost benefits come? Is it just because it's such a much smaller space that that's mm. why you can deliver it cheaper? Or yeah. is, it, is that a key barrier or is it a real opportunity of a tiny home? Um, I think that unfortunately this cost per square metre is actually higher because you still have all those upfront fees and you have all the upfront stuff going on. Um, but instead of having like a ballroom, which, you know, you, you build this room... And in this room, there would be three of our tiny houses, you know, like you could have parked four, out four three five. or four, right? Maybe th three of the one that I lived in, which was 18 square metres. Seven of mine. Oh, they're so tiny. Uh, <laughs> houses for <fans. laughs> Seven. Are you using but, the ceiling space? <laughs> it's but, got um, a huge ceiling. But like because there's in each of those houses there's bathrooms, you know, shower, toilet, like vanity, kitchen benches, ovens, stoves, there's wiring, there's plumbing, there's electrical, like each of them are working every square part, like every square is working very hard. There's no like hallway space, there's no like, so there's a lot of cabinetry for storage, there's a lot of things happening in every little bit, so the costs are actually quite high. So... That's the sort of the, the one of the cost things. But I think one of the benefits is that at least in Queensland, I think that people don't pay enough attention to the fact that we have such a benign environment that you can build this space and you can live outdoors a lot of the time as well. Your space can like blow out as long as you've got the core things that you need and that the space is well designed and not claustrophobic and meets all those needs. There's also a lot of like living out of the community. And that's one of the hidden benefits that you touched on as well. When we were living in our tiny house, we spent, and even in our house at the moment, which is really quite small, we spend a lot of time out in the community. We don't have a pool. We don't have an in cinema. We don't, so we're out and about. We go to the local pool. Often we go to the cinemas. Often we go out and about and use the community and a part of that a lot more, which is a, another benefit. It's not a, a, a environmentally sustainable benefit, but it's more like a social benefit, you know? And if you can bring a bit of that economic, social and environmental together, one of the things is build small. A lot of us are just building bigger because of resale value or because that's what we're expected to do. And <laughs> If I can interject, one building company uh, in Brisbane, actually I heard on the rumour bill, 
going, hey, guys, you've got to get into these tiny houses because $1,000 a square metre for a standard house, $4,000 a square metre they're profiting from selling tiny houses. They also have contributed towards the gouging in the industry, fixing of prices to go up and up and way too high, like at all the tiny, uh, the tiny homes expo in Cleveland last weekend. So they're, they're doing this. They're going, fantastic, let's capitalise on this romance for tiny housing. So it's got a bit ridiculous, but that's what you can expect. You're really selling it. Um, <laughs> got to be honest, though. We're coming to you for questions in a minute, but we have one final panellist that we want to interrogate, I mean, uh, talk to first, because apparently I interrogate in my bio. <laughs> um, Amy, can you, I start by asking you, what is the smallest freehold allotment that you've designed a house for? 38 square metres. So just bigger than your you know, typical double garage. And how big was the house on the 38 square metre block? Well, it's a little bit bigger than these guys because we kind of do two storeys in that particular one. Uh, so I think we're, we're edging up to 60. And I'm, I'm finding, you know, with this, those sort of more traditional product that I'm doing that, you know, that's, that's kind of the smallest I've really got to, maybe 50, but yeah. So that's a house and land package with a 38 yes. square metre block of land and a 60 square metre dwelling on it. That's amazing. Yes. Um, you and I share the legacy of NV Microurban Village, which is uh, the pictures up on the screen there. Um, it's a celebrated urban infill subdivision now, um, even more so than what when we built it 10 years ago. Can you explain how the concept of small living was integral to the project and to the buyers? And whether our original challenges now represent big opportunities or the hidden problems? Yeah, definitely. Well, the small living was what we had to do to target. We, we had in mind to target first home buyers. So we've got to get some people into some homes that are not boring, you know, just like Laura was talking about, that have some, um, you know, love about them and some freedom, which um, Jimmy, Jimmy mentioned is very close to our goals. So how do we get people into the, okay, make it smaller. All right, but then we, making it smaller wasn't enough because the price of the construction went up, but we had to make the values higher as well. So we attached the land to it. And so we could make the house small by getting it through it um, with land associated with it. And then we still tried to keep that price down by making a house land package so that the buyers could take care of their building contract, curated by the architect and administered by the architect. So they were under the guidance of that sort of, you know, um, comfort zone. But still they had the opportunity to make their own decisions about finishes. And it's lovely when you only have three doors in a house, you can actually choose the door you want. And it's not a big deal. Maybe you have to go without a pizza for two weeks after or something, you know? So these kinds of decisions are within your remit. Yeah, so um, that was it. So we made it smaller, we associated the land, um, the site was small, no amalgamations. We kept the density high. And when I say high density, sometimes people get a little bit worried. Think about it, not as high density, but think about it as being cosily close to all your amenities. You can just walk there. And as Lara was saying, instead of being um, in your house at night and sort of entertaining yourselves here out in the community, you go out for a drink and you, you know, you just get to know your neighbours and you know them by name. So there's that. Um, no, nobody corporate. Um, house and land package and reduce infrastructure charges because when you build a, when you have a block of land that is so small you can only have two bedrooms on it. Hey presto, you get to pay less for your infrastructure charge if you're smart like we were. So that's it. Big opportunities. Um, I think you know there are the, the there are the hidden problems as you alluded to. They're not so hidden, actually, I think. They're, in fact, um, you've got planning regulations basically are so fixated up minimum lot size. We just have to take a deep breath and have some faith um, that minimum lot size isn't the barometer of lifestyle. Um, finance, valuation gap, um, that's always a problem. Anything that's new, if you're different, diversity by definition is difference, different valuations, banks, mm, not a good mix. Um, so we you know, have to work through that. Um, the more we do them though, the more that will sort of, you know, that'll sort of even out. Um, and then we've got you know, the, the split contract risks is a little bit of complication there. And that brings with a couple of other things which have to do with patience because it's a, a two-step process. 
First, you've got to make the land. You almost have to choose the land before it's made, so it's a good fit. The, the land has to be created, plumbed in, and all of that. And then, of course, you, um, uh, you, you, you then do your house. So it takes a little bit longer, but the wait is worth it. So those are some of the hidden problems. Opportunities, let's do it more than just in our precious little PDAs. Let's get it out there so a few of us can enjoy this without all of the you know, myriad of hundreds of approvals that we had to go through. And um, you know, I'd like to say that the architect's important to the process. So maybe if everyone's a little bit nervous about um, one of these next door to them, if they knew that an architect sort of had to sign their um, registration on the line for delivering the right thing under a code, you know, maybe everyone would be a little bit more comfortable. And there's some beautiful examples out there. And um, I think the last thing to close on is that I think through <coughs> diversity, we can have abundance. So by doing small, well, Jimmy's done the math. How many? Ten in here. You, you, you have five of yours, maybe three of mine. <laughs> um, abundance through diversity. So we're all looking for lots and lots and lots of houses. That's how we can do it. Awesome. I've got one more question for you. Um, a key metric for us doing Envy was we wanted to deliver a $350,000 product to the market. We thought that was a key price point back in 2015. Now, with everything going up, you know, construction costs, land costs, everything, what does the next disruption in this small living space, tiny housing space look like in order to deliver a $350,000 kind of entry-level yeah. product to the market? It's a great question. And I think that, um, you know, just as we had to work hard to be innovative with Envy, have to work hard and redefine the problem and what can we do. Construction price is what it is. There's no fiddling around with that. Um, have to keep it small still. We have to keep it maybe repeatable, a bit simpler. Uh, Envy's um, prices were even higher than, um, you know, high because uh, it was built to boundary, back to back. It was constrained in an urban site. So we could, um, you know, we could do things that are a bit more repeatable, have a bit more space around them, but still get, um, you know, still, you know, share, basically take a lot that's not as expensive, it's in, it's in the um, neighbourhood, and maybe put four houses on it instead of one big house, four little houses instead of one big house. Maybe the infrastructure doesn't have to be um, t times by four because maybe we're going to share. Government has some programs now, and I think when we did Envy, what we did is we looked at what the first home buyer's grant was, and we worked from there. We said, that's their deposit. They don't need any more than that. Let's try to do the house based on that. We didn't quite make it. Well, if they had mortgage insurance, they would have. But it, you know, with the government home guarantee scheme now, um, you know, your 5% deposit, $700,000. What if two people shared that? All of a sudden, that's where you get $350,000 house. So there's a chance, not easy, but those are the, the parameters. It's, it has to do with sharing and being innovative and building community. So we're not all have to be in our own little house. We can have our own dignity, but we, uh, in terms of a space that's around, but we can still have a bit of um, touch it lightly um, communal living. And one thing to note on Envy is there's actually one bedroom, two bedroom and three bedroom houses within the development. So it's diversity in itself. It's a village. <laughs> Did you guys want to add anything before we throw to the floor? Is any burning? I just wanted to say I have a, a academic colleague that I sometimes write papers with called Samuel Alexander from the University of Melbourne. And he has a, a phrase that he says, private sufficiency and public luxury. And that's a perfect encapsulation of we don't need luxury in our houses, we don't need media rooms, but we need access to luxury, like mm. parks and pools and beaches and people. people. Yeah. Are there any questions? Uh, well, next door to Envy was the second one. And that's garden terraces. And then, and that was done so quickly after Envy. It was like, you know, you get some momentum and it went right in it because there was buyers and everything there. And then since then, no. And um, I'm, I'm, yeah. Is, is that because of the council or because people Not necessarily. Council? It's um, what, what I believe is that, when, you know, when I talked about the patients and some of the problems, the hidden problems, it's not the easiest development profile to do because it takes a bit longer. And I think um, being architect-led, it was great because we 
love doing design and we you know love all the outcomes but as a strict developer it does they do tend to perhaps want to do things a bit more quickly so I think that time element um, might be one of the things and it's just a bit different so the valuations all those things that make it a little bit different make it a little bit less attractive to the traditional developer so it takes just the right mix of passion and place I'll go on for Jimmy. Um, what's the blockchain aspect to the tiny homes? Did you read a thing I wrote on the internet with um, tiny my, mobile eco parks and blockchain? Because no, that's a really interesting question. Oh, um, well, back when blockchain and Bitcoin were kind of interesting, we were looking at it going, how great is this stuff? And then it all descended into just gambling. And then we left it. And actually, my first event was actually Bitcoin and blockchain, and then we went and did tiny houses and eco villages. It was the first tiny housing event in the country in Noosa. It was a very sold out event too. Yay me, right? Um, I, blockchain has amazing appeal for certain purposes, but as far as tiny housing is concerned, I guess I'd have to be really honest. It's kind of like what the contribution of Komodo Dragon would have to um, uh, American politics. Not very much. Um, but thank you very much for the question, because I have put the two together once before, and it was a good one. I liked it. Thank you. Thanks. And I got to speak as well. How good's that? <laughs> There's one up the front here. You've been so busy writing notes, you haven't had a chance to eat my popcorn. You're so diligent. I admire this. Oh, you're asking question now. I just wanted to ask about um, for the lots and, and splitting it up. So does that mean like you subdivided it first and then um, so you had to wear the cost of it and then offload it to when it, you're actually selling? Yeah, and I, I do want to clarify the previous answer that I gave to. Um, in the PDA, it's not um, the council rules that get in the way, but once you venture out of the PDA. So having made that clarification... because Oh, yeah... Thank you, Nicole. Oh, industry jargon. So sorry. Priority development area, which was um, created by the state government to basically say, let's experiment with things that are different. So no minimum lot size or basically virtually no minimum lot size that equals the density. So in the PDA, we've got the right to do it. Then it's the other things that become more difficult. So now to answer your question exactly. So the, what's unique about is it is a subdivision primarily as the development and the um, the houses came about by the fact that the uh, planning approval um, included the design and then the way that we marketed the lots was that we didn't want to leave anything to chance so the architect was embedded in the building contract so only buyers that sort of were on board with um, you know, that particular design and that particular um, sort of arrangement kind of were able to, to partake. So it was, you know, there weren't that many anyway, so it was just, it was a good mix. So there was that sort of process that the land had to be created first and then the building contract came second. They could have chosen another builder, they could have chosen another architect, but usually everyone that came there, they're going, no, no, I don't want a bar of that. That's far too hard for me, which is exactly right. So, it was, you know, we didn't realise it at the time. But there's no way anybody would really choose to do that on their own because it's very, very difficult. So being part of the group was just a real godsend, particularly as seven of them were first home buyers. Never done it before in their life. So there you go. Thank you. I've got a question to Heather as a researcher. Heather, how many landowners are actually aware that the Queensland government now has a housing opportunity portal on the website reaching out to landowners to make submission of um, ideas, applications, how we could increase the housing uh, opportunities. How many landowners are, are aware of that? 
Probably very few, <laughs> um, including myself, by the way. Um, <laughs> but yes, the, the 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 thing with governments, though, is they like to talk, um, but they don't necessarily like to put things into action. <laughs> and um, I suppose it also bears in mind that what I've also found throughout my the course of my research is that there's a consistent and I not including anyone in this audience, because I'm sure you're all experts, but um, a, a lot of people I've spoken to and on forums and on the social media are quite confused about the responsibilities of the different levels of government. And it's the, it, permitting tiny houses, for example, particularly if they're on wheels, is a local government responsibility and normally comes under local laws. Um, the federal government has no say whatsoever. The state government is, differs be, between the different states too. So in um, the state government is more powerful in, for example, Victoria and New South Wales because you have lots and lots of little local governments, say within Sydney. I don't know how many there are in Sydney and Melbourne. Lots anyway. Where, whereas Queensland has very large local governments, so it's quite different. So um, it's important if people are looking at different planning things and everything to sort of... Um, at least understand which level of government has responsibility. And there's not much point going to the housing minister, federal housing minister, complaining that, I don't know, scenic room won't let you build a tiny house on your property. <laughs> we only became aware of this because we met a landowner who very audaciously takes that on board and suggesting to have eight tiny houses on his land as a semi-permanent solution for three years. He's been very, very careful with the wording. That application is now in front of the Gold Coast Council. And we are awaiting the outcome and the resisting point to hear what our council has to say. So. That would be interesting because when the, start, the state government said, hey, landowners, we need your help. Make suggestions and we can help you negotiate with them. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, way over my head and I can't speak for any particular council, but council has the right to approve or reject a development like that. Sorcery might help in that case too. Um, panel, I'm interested in the promotional aspects of how you upscale people moving into tiny homes. Pardon the pun of upscaling and then downsizing. If I think about um, developments like Casuarina, um, I can't remember the developer's name, um, but one of the things that they did was they chose a high profile person, like say John Eels, who was captain of the Wallabies at the time, and they shoehorned John Eels into a property. And then, hey, presto, a lot of people are like, hey, I want to live like Eelsy. Um, how do I get myself one of them? Is there something in the psychology of that that you think might be relevant to um, promoting tiny, tiny homes? Marketing. But also, actually, I might jump in that one. If you love Hillsy, I can't say I know this person intimate. Eelsy, Hillsy, Eelsy. If he goes to live there, you might feel like you could form community with him. You might want to be in a community of people who follow Ilzy. And football, I'm guessing. Is it football? <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> Nailing it. <laughs> right. So what, what's he big for? Sorry. Um, you said say wallabies, yes. Native animal. So, <laughs> so if there was a chance that... Well, if there was a chance that people could congregate there, and this falls totally with our sort of white paper as to what we think future living could better look like at Polka Dot. So, you know, he could have a, a, a community of people who love football or maybe just love him. Um, and that's totally... An, um, that, that's taking living to the next level because, I mean, it is to us. It's about ultimately getting back to community in the village. So if he genuinely went there... And if it genuinely was cool to have all these people come to him as fan people and live with him and share his life with them and vice versa, then that's an absolute win. And imagine the mental health outcomes for everybody going, how amazing is it, is it to live with 
Ilzi from the P Wallabies. <laughs> Kangaroos. Are you so, talking about like kind of co-housing sort of stuff? We've been doing a couple of co-housing projects but without um, a footballer. And there have been people um, in a city not being able to buy one property but buying Nightingale. together a couple of... No, but this is like... Yeah, Nightingale's awesome too yeah. but that's at a larger scale. But a cu couple of our jobs had about three or four just in a city of Brisbane. A couple of families get together... They buy a property, they actually share a house together with kids as well and then we might come in and build like a little house out the back and then they sort of still live together but peel off and there's two households on the one block and that's all like allowed. You can build a granny flat up to 80 square metres with very minimal Huge. objection from the gut. Like, so yeah. if you choose the right block and if you have this intention and you figure that out, it's not quite at the same scale and there's no marketing scheme to it. But there are some really lovely outcomes which we've been lucky enough to be involved in. Absolutely. Can I just, um, so also, like, humans are actually social animals and they do what other humans do. So you'll see in any given street someone, like, plants a food forest. Next thing, oh, look, someone else down the road is planting a food forest. So humans tend to do things like that, but it's also quite... Years ago, I asked someone from one of the local governments, I think it was Logan, I think, I can't remember, and they said, oh, we don't mind the concept of tiny houses, but we want someone else to do it first, another council to do it first. But the momentum now is that increasingly that they're becoming more acceptable around the country. And it's also important to understand, too, that um, housing is a continuum. So people live in different types of housing and different sizes of housing throughout their life. And so they might start out in a tiny house or they might start out... And then they would, yeah, like yourself, for, for example, then move to a unit and my youngest son and his, his wife and they now live in a, a huge house on acreage with their family and um, her mother, her mother, and it's a multi-generational house. So, yeah, and then might move back into a tiny house. <laughs> Who knows? I think, uh, I was going to say, I think it's a bit like coffee. There used to be a long time ago when not everybody had a morning coffee, right? But now we all, so much of us, we often enjoy a morning coffee. I think tiny house and the way we live is going to be a bit like that. It is going to just kind of, you know, little grassroots things and beautiful things and then it's going to it's going to grow naturally. It's, it's a mindset. It's a, it's a little culture that we're going to create around it because living more lightly um, is just, it's just healthier. Soon they'll be clogging up the Bruce Highway. Thank you. I, I, a lot of the things I was going to ask have sort of been answered while I've been waiting, but I do think that um, I'm curious to know um, where how the tiny homes on wheels and, say, prefabricated or modular tiny houses can go. If you wanted to do one of those, where, how would you go about getting approval? I assume you have to go through your council. That's one thing. But the other thing is I think surely this is going to be driven by a generation who can't afford housing. If you've got, if your mom and dad have got a, um, a property that's big enough to take a tiny house in the in the in the backyard, I think there's going to be a huge demand for that sort of thing. If our children just are staring in wonder at nine hundred thousand dollar small townhouses and going, where are we going to live? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that policy is driven by the electorate, and I think that if people want, to a certain extent, um, want. Um, tiny houses to be available, they have to ask for them. They have to, to, to tell politicians what they want. And I think that this this recent initiative of, of allowing an 80 square metre um, second dwelling on majority of properties that can, you know, that can be accommodated is a great start. And I think that's going to become something that people exactly will see. You know, it's like the coffee. Oh, look at that. We could do that too. And it's going to start happening because there's going to be such a demand for that. And I think the, there is the issue of it's supposed to be for a family member, and that's how it will start. But eventually, you know, it may swap itself over. The family members grow up, become the you know the parents of the children, and the original parents move in, or you know, it will evolve. And I think that sort of gentle density that people talk about is going to happen quicker than we imagine, and we will see lots of great examples. I think that council should be regulating, should be. Um, interrogating how well it's done because if it's done well then people will like it and want to do more and not so much how big is it it should be how good is it I think that's a really good point and actually they have changed the rules regarding that I just wanted to that you the 80 square meter thing has been around for quite a while that's not new um, the granny flat thing but also 
that you can rent them out now. You don't even have to have your family. Like before when we did our first ones, it was like sneakily, yeah, yeah, Uncle Johnny lives there and we share toilet paper and we eat together twice a week. You have to be related to them. But this is no longer the case now. And even Victoria, they've got, they've overcome that. Um, Also, it's important to understand too that the different, the councils are all quite different. And um, what might be, it may not be 80 square metres in some councils, maybe what zone you're in in a specific council. They've also got um, separations, distances and setbacks and stuff like that. And I think actually setbacks, particularly road setbacks, is one way that we can increase density because we've already got rid of most of side setbacks. (laughs) And I just think road setbacks are ridiculous because they're so huge. Anyway, (laughs) but no, um, it it is moving, but just just, it's, it's, it's important just to understand that it's different between the different councils. Mm-hmm. And um, and my research into the council policies, regulations, for example, is most councils that I've spoken to are not opposed to tiny houses in various forms per se, but they're very concerned about that tiny houses, whether it's on wheels or not, well, on wheels they consider caravans, that they are actually able to be certified under the National Construction Code, Building Code of mm-hmm. Australia, because it's for health and safety reasons. I mean, if I, I could go build something in my, in my yard and it'd probably fall down and kill me and maybe someone else too because I can't build. Um, but also not to pollute the environment. And um, a lot of tiny house companies are selling, oh, no council approval required, which is not true because there's also things like Bushfire zones, um, flooding zones, agricultural setbacks, which are very important setbacks. And, yeah, so it's just very important to understand that. And they also want things not necessary to, they wanted to have good amenity. So I know it sounds a bit prosaic to say, okay, it must look nice. But believe me, if you live in the suburbs and you someone puts a tiny house on the property and it, it looks nice... There's going to be far fewer complaints. Aesthetics <laughs> are important. Mm. Are there any more questions? One up the front here. Yeah. Well, we have time for one other question yeah. after this. So. And I'd like to also do a proper answer for your good question about blockchain <laughs> and tiny houses. I've come up with the answer. I just breezed over to be a comedian, but actually there's something really important we can do. We'll get back to that in a minute. Stand by, folks. So, so putting words into actions... If there was somebody in this room that was interested in having a tiny house on a permanent place, where would they now go after this evening to follow up on that? Where would they find this place? Who should they contact? On wheels? Uh, no, not on wheels. Like a granny, little little tiny house built? Yes, but they've got no land, no house. I, th- I think, look... Um, through all of our um, Instagrams and social medias and websites, and I think you'll probably find some clues there. Could you tell me what the websites are called then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll let you know after. <laughs> I might answer that to say a building certifier would be the next port of call because you don't actually go through council to get necessarily approval. You get a building certifier who works on behalf of the council to help Uh, get you to legally and and systematically and logically put uh, another dwelling on your property, for example. So the building certifier, he's a private person who works for you and then he makes it work and then they put the paperwork together and submit it. Remember, a council just rubber stamps it. Need something drawn. Need something drawn? You You need to draw something for... I've got a piece (laughs) of paper. But also, if you haven't got... It's one way. ...land... Like Can I ask experts. A clarifying question. Are you talking about actually, for example, say a modular house that you put on someone else's property, or no, on your I'm own property? I'm talking about purchasing a small, uh, tiny house, mm-hmm. but you don't own any land. So you could buy a ten- tiny house on land, or where do you start? Where do you start doing your research well, if you want to purchase one? If you wanted to just buy the house itself, I mean, there's any number of companies that make, whether it's modular or pot or kit, pod or kit or tiny houses on wheels, the issue is where you're going to put that's it. That's right. Yes, that's, that's why we got out of it, basically. Mm. We were building yeah. them and the yeah. council stuff and we were just like, we know how to build little houses, but we're, this is only half the story. The oh. other half of the story is really tricky. We it has relaxed in what? the meantime, though. One of the um, things that I've been advocating the regulations. through the um, you know local talk about you know how do we solve this housing crisis is um, you know uh, 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 
secondary dwellings for duplexes. Mm -hmm. And I think there's um, some, you know, there's some ideas there that might grow and there might be opportunities. So I can talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it, it's difficult just, um, yeah, to look. Look um, what's um, what, uh, under the speakers' names and and to see what um, it's what they're into because if it's not them, it'll be somebody that they're related to or working mm -hmm. with. It's not super easy though. Like we tried to do co housing, like share, buy, and build with other people in Brisbane since finishing uni, and we had three failed attempts, and we tried really hard, but it's a lot of things have got to line up. Fourth time we've been lucky and we're co-housing sort of like intergenerational but it's not easy and the reasons that those other attempts failed is not even through lack of effort or energy but even things like funds aligning like the, the right people having money at the right time or wanting the same outcomes or mm. being prepared to you know it, it's just not easy to share live together but it's worth trying mm. right got one more question mm. and then we're going to wrap up could i have a second half of question or you haven't got time no, that's okay. All right, thanks. The other thing is if it's a portable tiny house and you move around parking it somewhere, uh, I know it's illegal to uh, actually sleep in your car, so is it illegal to just park on the street and sleep in a tiny house that's on wheels? Mostly, yes. The, 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 the Until you get caught. The trick, the trick is, is to um, find a landowner on whose land... That and in the in the more rural re, rural residential areas, there's lots of tiny houses. It's the suburban areas where there's problems. But another thing that's important too, and related to what Lara said, is the tenure. Any sort of co-housing or share housing, what sort of ownership or what sort of rental agreement do you have? And that's very complicated, um, particularly if you don't own the land. And that might actually quickly seg on to just the blockchain thing because we've got limited time. But, um, hey? Oh, no, 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 that's not our thing. <laughs> that's, that's something else. We are around before them. It's a cryptocurrency for those who don't know. Um, so delightfully, some of you come up with the idea that tiny housing can be put on spare bits of land around a traditional house. The kids can move there, et cetera, et cetera. So we've thought this whole picture through to, it, to its end so we can know what to help, tools to help build to people to enable this to happen as the government regulations hopefully uh, change and adapt in kind as well. Um, so it then creates this beautiful sense of we'll have greater community within our society and it's a disaster that's been good to have happen because we've all become quite disconnected, I think, living in our own houses. But when you're sharing psychologically a piece of land with somebody else, you're going to connect with them. We're also going to save the environment a bit, save a lot of money. And where the blockchain can come in, because um, blockchain is distributed agreements amongst lots of people. I'll explain it to you later if you want to see me about that. But We've actually almost finished work on an app which would do for what Uber is for taxis and Airbnb is for hotel rooms, is a land sharing app to take advantage of all this available land, which is so much of it is available, but we need to help people not only find it, and, and that's the answer, you, you can find places to share land, we share land. We live in Montville in the beautiful hinterland of the Sunshine Coast, and we're sharing multi, high value, million dollar tourist real estate up there, and we, we don't pay a lot for that. So it's a really great way to save money. But basically, an ecosystem of future living is that it's all about helping people live in community again, but also it's about establishing trust and something Heather is wishing to do because she's also got a bit of land she'd like to share out uh, to anyone who'd like to put a tiny house just to contract her, right? <laughs> She'd be up for that. Not on the spot, are you? But, uh, but Heather expressed a concern. I'd love to have someone stay, but I'm really not sure about opening the door because I know I get 100 people wanting to move in uh, and, and I don't know who these people are because you're going to share your life with a stranger. Now, the great thing about blockchain is that blockchain establishes trust between strangers and does it so spontaneously because reputation systems, when they're done responsibly, not the Black Mirror way, but responsibly, can help give us a good reference tool as to how these people behave. And, and, and we can help better select maybe people more compatible to live with us if we're landowners. So the blockchain could play a very big role, a very complicated way of doing it, but a very big, secure way of helping people live in community to the point where if you had a tiny house, 
uh, that could move, which is the best thing to have, because I live in one and I can vouch for it, five years, not talking rubbish here, um, is that if I don't like where I am at the time, I can just get up within two hours and move somewhere else. And if we use blockchain, I could literally turn up to somebody's uh, property at three o'clock in the morning if their agreements were turned on, set to that. And the blockchain computer processing, a little bit of AI, don't be scared of it completely, but, uh, but it would help uh, evaluate if that's going to be a win. As much as you can instant book an Airbnb, within five minutes you could turn up and just rock up. But you've got a reputation system behind you. And blockchain makes that reputation system credible and honest and trustworthy in ways that we can't even do with a reference you give to someone on a piece of paper. So that's how blockchain could help. But the whole point of that is the exciting part is we're moving towards community, which is such, we feel, a very important thing. Thank you. It was just uh, to Amy, um, NV was built 10 years ago. Obviously, there must have been changes of ownership in that time. I don't know if you know, has it retained its value? Are they... Are oh, they... gosh, it, it's gone well with value. Yeah. And to be honest, um, Nicole and I stumbled upon the fact that Nightingale was starting up about the same time we were. And we wrote our mission statement and because I am... I can never not talk too much. So our mission statement was more words, but there were a lot of similarities between the Nightingale mission statement and ours. But one of the main differences was that we um, wanted to give first home buyers the opportunity to get into a home, but we also wanted to give them the opportunity to um, have security of housing from then on. So the idea that that home would build them wealth was okay. They were taking a certain amount of risk. I would have called it like um, glow equity because they were taking a little bit of risk with the building contract and they were um, doing some of their design with their interiors and they were displaying patience. And um, so they deserved to get something out of that. And they did. And so the um, house line package price versus the first sales prices, they, they did very well. And, um, you know, that's not great for the next people because they kind of need to get in on the beginning and, and do that same sort of um, partnering, you might say. Um, but they are great value little houses that are there already done for people who want them and can afford them and like to live little. Thank you. Can I ask each of you now one word to sum up what we've just spoken about for the audience? One word. The first thing that comes to your head, Amy? Design. Lara? Uh, cr get creative. That's two. Oh, creative. <laughs> <laughs> no <Jimmy>? prepositions. <laughs> no prepositions. Uh, community. Flexibility. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank Nicole Bennett um, for leading this discussion tonight and, of course, all the panellists for giving us so much food support.